notes. Um, I am going to now um, share my screen, and we have we're going to do it a little bit differently than than last time. I have um, lightly edited uh, Dr. Uh, Adams' previous outcomes talk into into three into two chunks, and then I've added a bonus chunk of Dr. Jeremy Scheffner, who um, collaborated on this talk last year. So we will. Um, play each 10 minute clip, but please put your questions in as you have them. And I'm gonna pause and have a discussion after each 10 minute clip, and then we'll have a more, a larger discussion and, and try to answer additional questions after we've done each clip. But, but there's about three 10 minute clips. Um, I did do some post-processing of the videos, so they go um, a little bit faster um, without changing the pitch of the voice. So it will sound a little bit like Dr. Adams has pressured speech, um, but again, I, I think, you know, that, so that there was, um, I guess I need to put full disclosure, you know, when, when you see sometimes videos are manipulated, the video audio was, was manipulated and, and sped up. So, um, but with that, I will get to it. All right. Scales. I, I do not have any conflicts of interest and I will not discuss any treatment today. I do obviously receive grant support from NIH. Now, why, why do we do clinical research? Well, evidence-based medicine has changed the way we manage patients with neurologic disease, and guidelines, which are now the foundation of evidence-based medicine, have created standards of care. The information in the guidelines, and I participated in writing them, largely comes from clinical trials. And in addition, regulatory bodies such as the FDA and third-party payers such as Medicare are influenced by the clinical trials. So clinical trials really are crucial as we move forward in patient care. Now, one of the components of a clinical trial is developing outcome measures. These are uh, developed in response to the goals or the aims of the trial. These can be clinical measures or they can be some other surrogate measures such as a CT scan or MRI. These uh, will be uh, both primary and secondary measures. Because I'm a vascular neurologist, most of my discussion will reflect on clinical research and stroke, but they can be used as a model for research in other uh, neurologic diseases. Now, the primary goals in uh, stroke vary. It can be a prevention study such as CREST, where they're trying to avoid stroke or recurrent stroke and reduce mortality. It can be an acute treatment trial, such as the NINDS trial of TPA, which was aimed at limiting brain injury. It could be recovery and rehabilitation, looking at ways to maximize recovery. So we have three large sets of trials in stroke. And the design will then involve several issues. First is that stroke encompasses a broad spectrum of vascular diseases of the brain. Another is the uh, stroke can uh, affect different parts of the brain and produce different neurologic impairments. We have a, a high rate of comorbid diseases and there are epidemiological variables. And so generally, when you design a trial in stroke, it will be best medical care plus the new intervention versus a control. So what about surrogate markers in ischemic stroke? Well, we do have the potential for surrogate markers, so we're not. Surrogate markers include uh, changes on brain imaging or recanalization, for example, uh, but, uh, and then there are biomarkers which are being tested, but yet none of them have reached the point of being a primary outcome measure. The bottom line in stroke and in all of neurology is going to be, is the patient better off having received the intervention that is being tested? Next slide. Now, in other areas of neurology, it is possible that surrogate markers could be used, such as EEG, uh, vital capacity, nerve conduction velocities, some genetic factor or biochemical uh, factor. I think there's a real possibility that in the future, surrogate markers could be used to support clinical uh, markers in uh, determining outcomes in other areas of neurology. Now, what are the outcome measures that we're going to look at? In non-stroke research, we'll look at mortality, improving neurological status, maintaining independence by slowing progression, and prevention of recurrent attacks. The primary outcome measure will be determined, as I said once before, by the aim of the trial. Now, in prevention trials, the goal is to prevent recurrent events. These can be disease-specific events, such as a recurrent stroke, a recurrent bout of MS. It can be new comorbid events that we're trying to avoid, and of course, mortality. If the goal is to prevent progression, we're gonna look at new recurrences, new impairments, or neurological worsening, and then a global outcome measure. Now, when we talk about clinical rating instruments or stroke scales, we need to recognize there's a variety of things that we need to look at. Many of the stroke scales have been around now. For example, the NIH stroke scale has been available now for almost 35 years. We're gonna look at the types and severity of neurologic impairments. The scale like the stroke scale, the NIH stroke scale can look at changes in neurological status. We can uh, use the scores on the scale to influence decisions about treatment. We can use it as an outcome measure as well. So now what is required for a clinically raised, uh, useful rating instrument? It must have credibility. It must be germane to the clinical situation. It must be widely used and clinically useful. In short, the results of the scale should make sense to both healthcare providers and the public. 
that a knowledgeable person should have a mental image of the patient's status and given the score on a, on a stroke scale or any scale. For example, if a patient is coming in with a Glasgow coma scale of five, everybody on this conference call should have an image of a profoundly affected patient with a head injury. Similarly, if they come in with an NIH stroke scale of 25, we should recognize that as a major stroke with a patient at high risk for complications or mortality. So we should be able to have a good idea as to what the score means. Next slide. Now, how do you develop a clinical rating instrument or an outcome scale? This is a complex process that requires thought. We need to know the purpose of the scale. Is it measuring impairment, disability, uh, or not? We need to know the information that will be gained. It must be relevant to the assessment of the patients. Generally, a clinical rating uh, scale is based on the patient's performance, and it may include both history and examination. For example, the modified Rankin scale is largely determined by history, while the NIH stroke scale is modified as, uh, by examination. We need to define how the scoring of the new scale will interdigitate with other rating instruments. In short, there needs a clear plan for testing and validating the instrument that will be used. Now, what are the attributes of a useful clinical rating instrument? It should be easy for the patient and the assessor. It has to be doctor-friendly and patient-friendly. It cannot take too long or be too difficult. The scoring of the scale and how to assess it should be straightforward with clear instructions on the use and scoring of the scale. There should be inter-rater agreement that's high and inter-rater reproducibility that is high. In short, this, this, this scale itself must be valid and must be something that people can do easily and repeatedly. This requires educational and certification programs. In clinical trials, there's an extra requirement, uh, which is especially true for multi-center clinical trials. We need to know that the scale is administered correctly around all the centers. We need to know that the scoring is accurate and consistent around all the centers. In short, a, val a well-validated scale would need to be used. In addition, besides the education and certification of the centers, more recently, clinical trials have developed central adjudication. For example, in the trial, recent trial of uh, intraventricular TPA for treatment of intraventricular hemorrhage, we did videotapes of the outcome assessment and sent them to a central adjudication panel, where I must say, they scored patients differently than I did. Next slide. Now, there are several researchers on the uh, call who likely would like to do, uh, develop a new clinical rating instrument. I would encourage you not to do so. The process is time consuming and may not be successful. In short, the new scale may not work. Uh, in addition, third party uh, funders, such as NIH, may not be excited about a new unvalidated uh, scale, and it may, in fact, hamper your funding chances. It also delays the primary goal of the project, which is to test the intervention that you are, uh, you are going to examine. It is best to adopt or adapt current scales to your trials. So in short, let's not see new trials, new scales coming down the pike in this project. Now, the general organization of clinical rating instruments includes rating the severity of the illness, acute responses to treatment, and then longer term outcomes. Now there are terms that you're going to hear about, impairment, disability, and handicap. Uh, I use the analogy that impairments are what people have as a result of, a, uh, of an event. For example, I've had a spinal cord injury, so I have impairments in my limbs. I am disabled because I cannot do some of the things that I used to do before. And Impairment may not be the same as disability. For example, if two people are, are out cutting wood in the forest and both chop off their right hand, the vocalist may have the same impairment as the pianist, but obviously the uh, vocalist does not have the disability of the pianist. Generally, there are two types of scales that you will see. Numerical scales are based on a total of scoring components of assessment and a single score scale, which is based on an aggregate of all information rather than scoring individual items. I'm gonna go over two of these scales that are widely used in stroke and because you both have a, a models of each of these. Now, numerical scores add several items and add the scores together to give a total score. The total score may represent a different combination of items. Depending on the scale, a high score may be good or bad. Let's go over the example of the NIH stroke scale. Uh, all components of a single score will range from uh, put together to give a score that is good or bad or ugly, depending on how bad it is. Each score has specific and defined criteria. Generally, the higher the score, the poorer the outcome or situation. An example of this would be the modified Rankin scale. Now, in addition, there are modality-specific scales. These are generally used in rehabilitation and recovery and emphasize recovery or compensation in a specific activity, such as walking or hand function. They often do not provide an overall assessment of the patient's autonomy. Now, global outcome measures are generally used by third-party payers and the government because they will define favorable from unfavorable outcomes. These in stroke have been used in both acute and recovery trials and measure impact of multiple neurologic impairments and disabilities. However, such global measures may miss uh, discrete areas of neurologic disability and may overemphasize some components of recovery, particularly motor, and often have ceiling and floor effects. In addition, global measures of outcomes usually require much larger clinical trials. Now, when we move uh, to neurologic impairments and stroke, 
These are used to assess the baseline severity of stroke, which affects uh, prognosis and decisions for treatment. For example, many of the recent stroke trials have limited enrollment based on the baseline NIH stroke scale, with patients with very mild stroke may be being selected for treatment or excluded, and patients with very severe strokes on an NIH stroke scale, we'll say greater than 25, often are excluded. In addition, the NIH stroke scale uh, will allow measurements of improvement or worsening. As I mentioned earlier, the NIH stroke scale is the most commonly used instrument for rating neurological uh, impairments in the setting of stroke. It was developed by researchers at the University of Cincinnati, University of Iowa, and NINDS back in the 1980s. Next slide. All right, so that's our first little section. Um, if there's any uh, any questions that have shown up in the in the question or chat box, um, now would be the time to add some of those. Just to put a little kind of context onto that, you know, thinking about you know what's the difference between an outcome and an endpoint. Um, you know, again, when we're thinking of an outcome measure, we're thinking about oftentimes how someone feels, functions, or survives as a sort of registration type endpoint or an endpoint that you need to move the needle on to prove that a therapy is effective. Other things tend to be considered surrogate endpoints or something that is related to how someone feels, functions, or survives. For example, probably one of the best established surrogate outcomes in medicine is blood pressure. Um, most of the time, people don't feel a lot different based on variation in blood pressure, and that's why it's such a tough disease. The, there is, though, a, a very strong association between elevated blood pressure and risk of stroke and heart disease, uh, renal disease, uh, and visual impairments. So it's very closely related and has a, a well-established relationship. Therefore, you know, drugs that can reduce blood pressure um, are widely believed to often reduce those major uh, vascular complications of hypertension. Um, if there aren't any other questions at this point, I will go, go on um, to the next clip. So there are 15 items on the neurological exam. Each item is independently scored. Uh, that will get a baseline severity of the neurological uh, impairments. The scores range from zero, which is normal, to 42, which is the highest possible score. Uh, initial testing of this back in 19, published in 1989 showed a high interrater agreement and a high uh, test retest reliability. It also showed that total scores uh, were correlated with the size of infarctions on CT scan. Uh, subsequently, the scale was used in multiple other uh, trials and it's been translated to other What we have found is that the total score of the NIH stroke scale generally picks out prognosis with zero to three being mild and anything above 20 generally being very severe with poor outcomes. Next slide. We also saw that it was prognostic importance. This is our trial from our TOAST study, which shows that depending on severity of stroke, you can see how patients had excellent poor outcomes with generally patients with a score greater than 20 having a very poor chance of recovery. Now, there are advantages of the NIH stroke scale for stroke research, and there'll be similar things with some of the standard scales and other aspects of neurology. It is a well-validated measure of stroke severity. It can be performed rapidly. There's good correlation with outcomes. It can be used for both acute and long-term care planning. It has high inter agreement and inter reproducibility. Uh, it can be administered via telemedicine, and educational and certification programs exist. Now, there are disadvantages of the NIH stroke scale, and this is one that, as an author, I readily admit, it's biased towards the left hemisphere. Scores are higher with left hemisphere stroke than with right hemisphere. There can be a range of scores among uh, raters. Some of the items do not work as well as others, particularly the scoring of ataxia, facial weakness, and aphasia can be difficult. But to address this, there have been certification programs developed for the NIH stroke scale. We did one uh, in the early 1990s, that's a paper by Albanese, and Pat Leiden and his colleagues at UCSD did one to come up with ways to remediate and to actually certify our raters. And the National Stroke Association found that there are a range of raters with, once again, aphasia and facial weakness being the most problematic items on the scale. Next slide. So where are we with the NIH stroke scale? There have been notable attempts to uh, come up scale, but the original version remains the standard. It is now the most widely used clinical research assessment scale of stroke uh, severity in the world. It's used both in research and clinical care. National guidelines provide recommendations based on the NIH stroke scale. Uh, it is uh, 
do uh, stroke like the Glasgow Coma Scale or score is in patients with trauma. If you're going to do a stroke trial in the, one of your research projects, at the present time, you should not plan on replacing the NI stroke scale with something else. And also a standard measure for uh, severity for patient entry. Now, global outcome scales have been accepted by the uh, medical community, uh, government regulators, and authorities. These are used in both acute and recovery studies. These are more useful for testing medications that would have an impact or any other intervention in multiple areas of the brain. Now, they may not be particularly sensitive to important uh, improvements, such as discrete areas of neurological recovery, and they may have ceiling and floor effects, as I mentioned earlier, may require larger trials. The most commonly used uh, stroke outcome measure is the modified Rankin scale. A uh, Rankin developed this in the 1970s and early 80s. It was modified by adding another category later on, and so there are at present six categories. It is internationally accepted and widely used in stroke studies. Uh, it tells about the status of the patient. It, unfortunately, it emphasizes motor limitations and walking. Uh, Still, it gives different scores and levels of recovery that can be understood by the public, by physicians, and governmental bodies. The scores are zero, no symptoms at all, to six, dead. The no symptoms at all is a very hard score to get if you really look at it. So that if somebody goes hiking after a stroke and does well, but by the end of the five-mile hike has a little dragging of the leg, that would move him down to a score of one. So it is very hard to achieve a zero. Uh, the real goal has been separating zero and one, or zero, one, and two from the other scores, moderate disability, moderately severe disability, and severe disability. If we look at how this has been done, we can see that uh, in a review of series of uh, reviews of the modified ranking scale, we found that the intermediate agreement is fairly reasonable. But as you go down, you can see uh, uh, there are problems with reliability with this scale as well, even though it is all to be done by direct asking of history. Next slide. Modality specific scales are primarily used in rehab. Uh, it's looking at a device or a local intervention uh, and may involve impairments that may improve at different rates. These can generally be done in smaller numbers of patients. Uh, but they have not much information about overall outcome. And these may not be understood well by the public, by clinicians, or governmental bodies. Now, one of them is the Fugelmeyer score. This has been used by physical therapists. If you look at it, there's a score of 226 points, with each item rated from one to two. If you go through there, you can see how many things that have to be checked. It takes 45 minutes to do this assessment. We have done this with trials in Iowa, and neither the administrators nor the subjects we're very happy at the, after the end of the first assessment, and the enthusiasm for sequential assessments was not great. Now, there has been some attempt to break up this into smaller components that might be more palatable. In addition, if you ask a physician uh, what the Fugelmeyer score is, most of them will have no idea of what this score is. Now, I'm not bad-mouthing the Fugelmeyer score, per se, but giving you the idea that you have to be very careful about what scales you pick. Another scale is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, obviously looking to detect mild cognitive impairments. This takes approximately 10 minutes by direct observation, you cannot do this over the phone, and it tests a variety of higher cognitive uh, uh, functions. Uh, we can do this uh, in an outpatient clinic. Now, we've not used this in stroke trials, but I think there is a real place for this. And this may be more sensitive than the mini mental status exam, but maybe less specific. The Barthel Index, which is one of the scales we use, are for the subject or caregiver. It does not require uh, much training. There are 10 items that are scored, zero for unable to do, all the way up to 10 to 15, depending on whether the patient is dependent, partially independent, or totally independent. The scores range from zero to 100, with 95 and 100 being no disability, institutionalized under 60. Once again, this is a very heavily weighted towards motor function. Now, one of the nice things that, uh, it is, it does uh, test things that are important, such as being able to climb a flight of stairs, or being able to go to the toilet on their own, or being able to eat on their own. And, uh, unfortunately, it's relatively insensitive. Still, healthcare providers understand what this means and it can be an important secondary outcome measure in stroke recovery trials. Another uh, scale that's now becoming more widely used is a quality of life measure. These are being used in a variety of therapies in neurology. It covers a broad range of functioning from physical uh, recovery, psychological health, social status, and general health. This generally is influenced by the person's experiences. Uh, these are, have not been the primary outcome measure, but are a supportive one. The two most commonly being used are the Euroqual and the stroke impact scale. The Euroqual has a, is, is a simple and brief self-administered instrument. There are Five, psych, five dimensions that are checked for mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain or discomfort, anxiety and depression, with one being no problem and three being severe problems. In addition, a scale is given where the patient with 100 being the best possible score to zero being the worst imaginable. They're supposed to bark the line where they think they are. So this scale, the Europol, has been used and I think it's got a real promise for a wide variety of uh, research trials in neurology, not just stroke. The stroke impact scale is a little more complex. It involves multiple, multiple domains of uh, stroke recovery and is reported by the patient, rated one for worst to five best. Uh, and as you go down there, you can see 
a huge number of components that are checked with a wide range of uh, activities that are scored. This takes a longer time to do and has not yet been as widely used in large part because of the complexity of all the components in the quality of life measure. Now, to help coordinate uh, studies and to compare them with other research programs, NINDS has made the following recommendations for uh, patients, uh, for researchers to do trials of stroke. For neurologic impairment, the NIH stroke scale. For functional status, the Barthel Index and the modified Rankin scale. For emotional and cognitive studies, the Montreal Assessment Trail Making Test and a depression scale. For quality of life or participation, the Euroqual, and for performance, walking speed. The European uh, regulatory bodies have come up with something quite similar. Functional outcomes, Barthel Index, global outcomes, the modified Rankin scale or the Glasgow outcome scale, and neurological deficit scales, the Scandinavian stroke scale, Canadian neurological scale, the NIH stroke scale, or unified stroke scale. So what do we have? Currently, we have a wide variety of clinical scales to use in research. I've shown you the example of some of them in stroke. Multiple other neurologic diseases have similar scales. Remember, the selection of the scale for your research project should be influenced by the face value of the scale, its internal construction, and its ability to be reproduced. You need to select, these scales will be used to select patients for enrollment in the trial. You want a scale that is reliable, that is precise, that is valid, that is feasible, and acceptable. The choice of scales should be influenced by the primary aim of the research, an acute versus long-term intervention based on the duration of follow-up, the nature of the intervention, and the primary hypothesis. Remember, we will look for halting worsening of the disease, improving outcomes, uh, looking at adverse events related to the intervention or not, and any new events that occur. The trial must have measures to ensure accuracy of these outcome measures. This means that you have to select sites that are going to be care uh, carefully done. You will then need to certify the investigators. You want to use the scales for patient selection in the trial, for periodic follow-ups, for endpoints and outcomes. Now, there are ways to get around this. You can do central assessments of outcomes with in-person interviews, via telephone uh, construct, uh, videos or teleconferencing. And finally, now with uh, accuracy, we have now adjudicated endpoints and outcomes. This is particularly true in a trial that cannot be blinded because of the nature of the intervention. So in conclusion, we can provide a quantitative element to a complex uh, situation using a scale. A scale score fosters communication among healthcare professionals. It will give you a way to describe your results in a way that is clinically meaningful. Hopefully at the end of your trial, when you show your results in using scales, both the researchers and clinicians will have an understanding of what these scores mean in these instruments. And I thank you for your attention. I know I went through this fast, but I wanted to save a good portion of the time for uh, a discussion. Thank you. You definitely went through it fast. All right, so we have a question here. Um, is it appropriate to use a novel composite endpoint for the first time in a clinical trial when each component of the composite have already been validated, but the composite has never been used in uh, previous studies? Not what are the ways around using composite endpoints as primary outcomes when the composite is not already validated? So that's a, um, say that that's um, a relatively tough question. Um, and I think this sometimes comes up in um, cardiovascular studies when, you know, there's, there's sort of a composite of, of death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. That's one of the more common places that we've seen um, composite outcomes used. I think in the neurological space, there's, you know, using, you know, a novel, a novel combination of things. Usually one of the reasons to use a composite outcome is because you think in each of the individual components, there may not be enough events for this study to be um, informative. The so there, there should be, I guess, a really good solid structure of what the causal pathway of the treatment and the disease progression are to include those, th you know, put those things together as a composite. Um, but I think putting things together that haven't frequently been put together, um, you know, adding something in that perhaps isn't validated to an overall composite measure I think would still suffer with, with from some of the other the same dangers that um, Dr. Adams talked about in terms of, of having a new measure out there for the first time. Um, I don't know if any of the other CTMC faculty 
um, Dr. Gutman or Dr. Coffey had anything they wanted to add on that. I, I would just add that one of the challenges, <clears throat> especially if you're using it for the first time in a large scale clinical trial, which I would recommend against, is that you're often making an assumption that each of the components are equally weighted in terms of their importance. And that's not always true. And so, you know, without some type of assessment or sense of what it's showing, it, you, you can get an answer that may not be in line with what you want, what you want to get. So I, I think whether it's a composite or really any type of endpoint, it's really hard to justify the use of any endpoint in a large clinical trial that hasn't been assessed and validated in some way previously. And, and I would just add, even if the individual components have, it's really fundamentally no different than if there's a validated questionnaire that you're using it in a different way. Once you change it, it's no longer validated. So putting two pieces of validated outcomes together doesn't mean you have a validated composite. Right, there's not a, uh, a transitive uh, property of outcome measures, for example. So yeah, no, I mean, I think that advice is, is good. You, you really, particularly for a main outcome measure, you have to be very cautious. I, I do also think that it's important, you know, similar to what we talked about on the uh, pilot and feasibility call, that you may have a primary outcome for an early phase study that isn't the overall final pivotal outcome. In fact, you, you likely should, but you should have an eye to what that pivotal outcome is going to be in your follow-up studies because it may be important for you to understand more about the variability of that outcome measure, how it's going to be, um, you know, looked at. I think we, you know, a, a couple webinars ago, we, we talked about one of the, you know, a, a test that does a, a neuropsychological assessment that has typically been used at 20 minutes and the, you know, the age appropriate norms for which that scale were validated were done with a, a 20 minute delay before having people, um, and it's, it's escaping me which exact test it is, um, was typically been used, but other studies have used a, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the study was baked in with a 30 minute delay, um, but, and that was how it was validated, but other studies have used a 20 minute delay. So that's, you know, that outcome measure is not as compatible and comparable to the ones done in the studies that use it at, um, you know, with the you know, 20 minute delay and 30 minute delay are not equivalent. So I think, you know, it's a good question. I think composite measures can be a whole talk in and of themselves. So great questions. I'm gonna to go to so the final clip. There's a little bit of overlap here, but I think this is really complimentary. So this is from um, uh, Dr. Scheffner talking about outcome measures and we're moving a little bit away from stroke to some other disease processes, although uh, strength is really uh, major focus here. So here we go. I want to talk about strength a little bit just because um, it is an example of how you even you have to think about the appropriate marker and measurement, even if you've decided what attribute you want to measure. So strength you would think was a pretty intuitive thing to measure, but it's not. If you remember how you do this in clinic with the MRC grading scale of five being normal and zero being no activity, uh, that measurement has been used in clinical trials, but it's a massively non-sensitive, non-linear test. And I'll show you an example of that. This is uh, looking at the biceps, and the top scale is somebody who graded the uh, biceps with the MRC grades from zero to five, and on the bottom scale are the actual force measured in Newtons. And you can see that the difference in force going from zero to one to two to three very, very small. And the difference from three to four is very large, and four to five is even larger. So that, that this is a scale that even though you, you have five, five uh, uh, categories, most of the strength of a given muscle is in grade four and grade five. And so you need a better way of measuring strength. We use quantitative muscle strength, and we, we train evaluators very carefully to use a hand handheld ammometer. And in that way, we can get linear declines in strength over time in diseases that, that have progressive weakness. In phase three, trials, you need clinically relevant endpoints. And, and, and that's an NIH decision and an NIH um, uh, 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 definition. So what is a clinically relevant and endpoint? And FDA as well. Clinically relevant, is a, a clinically relevant endpoint is a, is a measurement of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. That's the entire definition. Uh, and, and clinical relevance is, is how, patients feel, how patients feel, function, or survive. It can be completely subjective or it can be objective in terms of measuring capacity. It can be survival or it can be timed to a specific disease-related event. 
Um, but it's often, even though it's a simple definition, deciding what's clinically relevant is, is somewhat uh, um, fuzzy in some cases. For example, in a disease such as ALS where patients lose strength, is strength clinically relevant? Well, so far the FDA has not been clear on this. Uh, they've, they've made comments such as, well, we don't care how, somebody strong, how strong somebody is when you measure it with a dynamometer. We would care about how they walk across a room. And so you have to show us that kind of relevance when you think about strength. But these discussions are, are obviously still ongoing. Functional scales, and, and Dr. Adams talked about the stroke scales, are, are, are clearly clinically relevant. They ask patients about their capacity. Uh, however, they're not always linear, and the extent of, an, of a difference in a rating scale isn't always obvious in terms of how clinically important, important it is. And there are many scale, aspects of scaling that have been poorly attended to in the scales that we use today. And, and one issue is interval scaling. Uh, so in, in, in a, in a, in a in stroke scale, is, is the difference between a 10 and 11 the same as the difference between an 8 and a 9? Nobody's really paid attention to that. And so designing new scales is going to be important, but if you're going to do a study, you need to use a scale that's already been, been, been used before. Um, so functional scales can be either disease specific or attribute specific. So quality of life scales can be uh, applied across disease states, but um, the modified ranking scale is, is a stroke scale. The EDSS is, is only appropriate for MS and the ALS functional rating scale is only appropriate to ALS. And in, within a given scale, you can assess multiple properties of, of the disease. So for example, the ALS functional rating scale assesses breathing, mobile function, fine motor function, and gross motor function all within the same scale. Uh, and so given that, it's often difficult when you see a change within a scale, say from 45 to 47 or 38 to 27, to know what that means in terms of what happened, what's happening to the patient as those, scale, those, as those different scales, uh, scale uh, values are, are determined. Does it mean somebody is weaker in the arms, weaker in the legs? Does it mean they're having more trouble talking? Oftentimes you can't determine those kinds of issues just by looking at the, the value of a rating scale. Moving on to time to event endpoints, uh, these can be uh, time to an event as defined by a change in a functional rating scale. So you could say, uh, I'm going to use as my primary endpoint the time for a change in a, the EDSS of two points. Or it can be a time to death, a survi survival is a time to event. Or it can be time to a new hospitalization or time to a new stroke. All of those kinds of uh, measurements are time to event endpoints, and they're clinically relevant because they assess functionally important characteristics. Uh, the advantage of using a time to ascent, uh, event endpoint is that usually people can agree on when that endpoint has been reached, and so they're easy to understand. They're also easy to power and for statisticians, so statisticians like them. But they have disadvantages too. And, and one is that really only subjects who have had an event contribute to your trial. So if you're looking at a, a, a fatal disease such as ALS and survival is your endpoint and is your event, then only those patients who die contribute to that endpoint. The ones who survive really uh, don't, don't participate in, in the in analysis in any useful way. And, and I'll show you an example of that in a, in a minute. Um, if it, the, other, the other thing is if you use a non-death related endpoint, um, you, you can pick a time to a five-point change in a rating scale, for, for example, but that means those patients who have changed by three points don't contribute to your endpoint either. So where you put your, your, your event is very important. Um, let's talk about survival, and here's two, two different survival curves for two different kinds of experiments. Uh, this again is ALS, uh, and on the left is a survival set of survival curves for a treatment in mice where you follow all of the mice until they die. And so you can see that um, on the, the, the dotted line is a placebo-treated uh, set of mice, and the dark curves are, are treated with a, a treatment that's not terribly relevant. But what you can see is that there's about a 20-day survival uh, difference in, in, in these mice. And if you did a statistical test, this would be highly statistically significant with a modest change in survival. And the reason that it's a fairly, and, and there are only 20 mice per group, so it's a 40-mouse 40, 40 study. And the reason that you can see a modest change in survival in a, in a relatively small study is that every single mouse had an event. So Data on the right, these are survival data that led to the approval of Rilizol in 1996. And you can see that the, there are three doses, 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, and 200 milligrams daily of Rilizol, and the placebo curves of the change are, are identical in all, in all three, three panels. And you can see that the difference in survival, number one, depends on time, and number two, is actually very small. So um, it, at, at one year of treatment, for example, the difference in survival is about 10%, which was about 30 patients difference in the, in the Rilizol-treated patients versus the placebo patients. And the only reason that this was statistically significant was that 900 patients participated in this study. So that even in a fatal disease, a time to event endpoint is going to be very insensitive and will require a ton of patients if most patients don't reach the endpoint. So again, we talked about the different kinds of binary endpoints that you can use. Survival is obviously one. Hospital readmission, time to new stroke, time to initiation of a disease-related event, and for example, non-invasive ventilation in, in patients with ALS. Um, if you have a, a, a treatment that is intended to cause improvement, then a binary endpoint could be time to achieving functional independence, or if you're intending to improve ambulation, time to achieving independent ambulation. All of those would be useful kinds of, of, of binary events. So this is a, a really fast run through of a variety of different endpoints that can be used in clinical trials. And so uh, when you're thinking about your own study, um, what, 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 what's appropriate? What do you, what, what do you want to use? Uh, Dr. Adams made a plea for using a tried and true endpoint. And in terms of functional endpoints, I, I think that's, that, that is by far the most conservative and by far the most sensible. But in earlier phase studies, and most of your studies are going to be early stage, um, you're not necessarily trying to make a decision of whether your intervention 
clearly works in the study that you're proposing in this course. You're, you're, you're much more interested in, 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 does it make sense? Is it reasonable? Does it pass the first stage? And the first stage is often the pharmacodynamics kind of stage or even the pharmacokinetic stage, which is, does your drug get to where it wants, where it needs to go? Does it have an effect on your target? And that can be measured with fluids, be measured with, with, with imaging. And depending on your drug, depending on your disease and depending on your target, um, a, a worthy goal for a, a study that, that somebody might do in this in this uh, in, in this course is a, a, a pharmacodynamic marker study, and you may even use markers that you haven't completely defined the characteristics of. So there there is a desperate need in, in virtually all fields of neurology for better pharmacodynamic markers, and and th those may be the subject of your uh, of your studies that, that you're bringing forward to the course. Um, no matter what you 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 pick, what you need to know is in later phase certainly relevance to clinically important endpoints. Um, but for all, for all endpoints, new or old, you need to have some idea of the variability both in normal subjects and in your disease patients. And, and you need to have some idea of the sensitivity of changing this endpoint as a function of your intervention. Uh, and then if you're using a, a time to event or bi binary endpoint, you need to have a, a, an estimate of how many of your subjects will, will, will have an event in the time period of your study. Because if it's not very many, you're not going to be able to successfully use that kind of endpoint. So in summary, the, the choice of endpoints is, is critical in the design of clinical trials at any stage. Endpoints need to be reliable. At later stages, they need to be clinically meaningful. And if you're going to use it, use these endpoints for it as a clinical outcome measure, they need to be sensitive to your disease modification strategy. Um, to choose endpoints appropriately um, is, is, is one of the critical tasks of, of, of a clinical trialist. And the correct choice of, end, of, of, of endpoint can really change your probability of success. And success, to me, is defined by making a correct decision, not by necessarily showing that your drug works. You need to be equally successful in showing your drug doesn't work. Um, the currently available toolbox of merit measures in phase two um, is not adequate, and so um, we need new measures. And, and to do that, we need to new, know not just about whether how they change in disease states, but how variable they are, how they change over time without therapy. And, and but the ability of finding these kinds of endpoints is likely to make our, our, our trials in all fields of neurology more efficient, um, more accurate, and and uh, more cost effective, and to bring therapies to patients much more quickly. So thank you, and I'll take questions. All right. So again, a, a fast uh, overview of the outcomes talk from, from Dr. Jeremy uh, Scheffner. And the, you know, I think what, a couple of key things there at the end in that, you know, the importance of your study is determining whether your intervention works um, or has a chance at working. Um, and there needs to be a possibility that it's gonna find that it doesn't and maybe should be tweaked or, or, or turned off. There was a bit of a emphasis in this on drug trials, and I know that a lot of people do studies in other areas, whether it's devices or behavioral interventions. So I think one of the things that is most important when selecting an outcome measure, and when we have had the clinical trials methodology course in our small groups, we have spent a lot of time refining and tweaking the justification for outcome measures and which ones to use. Crucial question to ask yourself is, is there a well-specified explanatory model that kind of shows how the intervention links to your outcome of, of interest? You know, are you affecting something on this causal pathway? And I think that cuts across all types of medical research, um, including preclinical research, um, definitely in drug trials, but definitely in the trials. So um, if that, um, Dr. Gutman, did you want to add anything? I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yep. I think, okay, good. Um, so um, all of this went by really fast, but I think, um, you know, for the, all the parts together, I mean, one of the things that's interesting at this point um, is also, I think it was touched on briefly, was the, the, the issues of um, looking at ceiling and floor effects of your outcome measures. And, um, and then um, also what window of a disease you're looking at. And I think those two things were kind of pointed out. I just wanted to bring that up again. If you're looking at a disease that, um, so like Jeremy's, um, scales, right? And if you think about motor scales, if you're looking at a disease where people don't, their weakness doesn't progress rapidly, using the MRC scale doesn't work very well, um, right? Or they don't improve, you know, or if they don't, if depending on how they improve. So cho choosing your scales all really is uh, very dependent 
um, on the disease that you're looking at, the stage of disease you're looking at, um, and what you expect to find. Yeah, and I, I think to, to, to piggyback on that, the, you know, another issue is how these scales might perform in real life and what, and, 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 that, and, and what you might expect in a disease process for somebody's change time on these scales. And that's something whenever you're collaborating with a, a statistician to help design and power a study, you know, that sounds a lot like a statistical question, but that is a clinical question in terms of the dynamics of an outcome measure. You know, how much change can you expect over time? How much variability there is between subjects, um, both for acute conditions and progressive conditions. Um, and if we knew exactly how fast somebody with ALS was gonna progress, you know, our life would be um, much easier in designing trials, but unfortunately it can be a, a challenge to predict. Similarly, if I knew exactly what somebody's NIH stroke scale was gonna be at three months, if I saw their baseline and knew if they were treated with TPA and when, it'd be much easier to design stroke uh, studies. Um, you know, a similar issue and, and you know, it, is that you know the, the NIH stroke scale is that test of function uh, you know of, of of neurologic abilities, but not necessarily disability per se, because some people can have a very low NIH stroke scale but be profoundly disabled if they're getting a couple points from ataxia, for example. So um, you know the limitations in your outcome measures are something that you need to become highly expert in and know more about how you might expect them to perform in practice. Yeah, and then the other thing is, um, what is the meaningfulness, is that a word? Yeah, meaningfulness of, of the, yeah. what you're measuring to the patient. Um, you know, I think that's why people like the modified Rankin scale so much, right? Because it has to, it's a functional scale. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, there is some functional component to it as to how you might be able to function in society. You can be independent or not. Um, and, uh, and that's why I think the Barthel Index is always tempting. In, not that I'm a stroke neurologist, but it's supposed to be functional measurements. And that's why the quality of life um, outcome measures are being so much encouraged by the FDA and by NIH, I think, as well as um, uh, pharma, because um, what does this really mean? You know, we measure something and it means nothing to the patient, right? <laughs> it's a scale, we developed it, it's a change, we can measure that, but the patient still can't. And, then, and I think that, again, goes back to what Dr. Adams was talking about, the difference between um, impairment and disability, right? His comparison of the vocalist versus the violinist. Right. I remember what he yep. talked about. But if you right, no, no, hand, the injur injury vocalist. to the hand, losing either strength or losing the hand in a, in a, in a trauma. Um, yeah. So going to the uh, question from Dr. Sharani about, can the terms exploratory and tertiary outcomes be used interchangeably, given exploratory outcomes are usually optional? In general, do you recommend not to include them in the proposal to avoid potential criticisms or not? So generally, the philosophy is terms of what's defined as a primary outcome measure and a secondary outcome measure versus exploratory, or, or maybe sometimes tertiary, maybe sometimes exploratory. I guess I tend to look at them as primary, secondary, and exploratory lumped together, um, particularly for smaller studies um, and most proposals, a grant reviewer is gonna wanna see how much power you have on primary and secondary outcome measures and the movement in them. Um, you know, possibly if it's a complete pilot study, you know that this is the range of, of uh, you know, this is how much precision you might have in estimating something like, like say a blood pressure. But I would say that if there are things that are important, let's say I was doing a, a very, a, you know, like an early phase stroke study, and I'm looking at change in volume um, from a baseline perfusion scan to a follow-up MRI. Not certain that that's a, a validated surrogate outcome yet. Um, some people might say it's getting there. Some people might not. Um, but 
it would be, even if I only was looking at 20 patients, it would be standard for me to include the modified Rankin scale, even though I wouldn't, I would have very abysmal power if let's say it's a, you know, a 10, you know, 20 patients on one group, 10 patients on the other, in terms of seeing differences in the, in the modified Rankin. So I would tend to classify that as an exploratory outcome. It's included because it's important to measure in stroke patients to, to sort of calibrate where your study is, but to look at the group comparisons would be fraught with peril because it's such a, a small number to be compared on. So I think that's, I, I guess, typically how I sort of triage things to primary, you know, primary is the you know, main question, secondary are a relatively discrete number of very important questions that you have perhaps not 90% power on, but some degree of power to answer or are important for safety, such as like mortality. Um, and then everything else tends to be exploratory. Um, Dr. Coffey, did you have any other um, thoughts on, on how you choose where you designate the outcomes? I, th I mean, I think you can do it either way. I think in my mind, a more important question that often needs to be considered. There's often a temptation to put in a high number of exploratory endpoints. And you know, there's all kinds of scientific justification for doing that. But operationally, you have to be careful because if you overload the protocol with too much, with either cost or complexity of collection, you end up potentially offsetting your ability to answer your primary question. Um, particularly if you're not paying attention to patient burden and how much time it's going to take to do that. So I personally, I try to work with collaborators to minimize the number of exploratory endpoints as much as possible. Um, because in some ways, I think exploratory endpoints are often used as I don't have power for this as a secondary, but I want to cast a wide net to make sure I see something with the drug because I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. Uh, which is not really the, the intended use of exploratory endpoints. Um, things that can come along for the ride cheaply or are collected anyway, I think can be done as exploratory, but I don't know that you necessarily need to put them in the protocol because almost by definition, the number of exploratory analyses you can do at the end of a study can't be specified up front because they're exploratory. So there's any kind of an endless number of things that you could look at. So personally, I don't worry about it that much. Yeah, one other pragmatic aspect to it is if you choose to, and I think Chris's idea about being judicious is crucial in that, you, you, you know, particularly if it's a small sample size trial, loading things up to see if maybe you can find something. There's, there's just the idea of scientific coherence. If you have one, you know, if you show a great effect on the Barthel index, but you're, you're not showing anything on the modified rank or movement on the NIH stroke scale, you know, would you really believe it? And I think the answer is no. And I, th I think you have to sort of think through some of those questions. Maybe you're including something because there's a historical reason and you're gonna need to have that in your main trial later. But you know, both the balance of participant burden and just sort of research waste in general as to like what you're gonna do with those um, values is just important to consider. The... Um, so I think, but, but it, you know, again, you're know, choosing your outcome measures is quite, quite hard, but quite important. Um, you know, the, the other complexity is that when you start to do result reporting in clinicaltrials.gov, um, for each of your intervention arms, you do need to report um, your primary and secondary outcomes um, for each of your groups which is something you need to be relatively choosy about as I'm starting a 50 site uh, cardiac arrest um, neuroprotection with hypothermia trial. And we have 20, treatment, 20 potential treatment arms in terms of different durations of cooling in both shockable and non-shockable rhythms. If I had 20 um, secondary outcomes, which we don't, um, but the people who end up ultimately having to enter that into clinicaltrials.gov will um, justifiably want to hurt me um, when we have to put in the people with and without those outcomes in each of those 20 groups. So, all right. Um, any other questions? I think at this point, we're right up at the end of time.
there is an evaluation link um, on there. Oh, another good, um, <laughs> Dr. Conway is definitely pointing out that this was the study that I'm citing was, is a large phase, you know, large, carefully planned over a period of approximately 11 years, um, NIH FDA joint effort um, with a very, very complicated design. You can learn more at icecaptrial.org. But if you're in your early stage as an investigator, um, designing something like IceCap and figuring out how to put it in clinicaltrials.gov is, is probably not a good idea. So I, I think that is, is very, very uh, true and reasonable advice. Um, the next webinar is gonna be in two weeks on common data elements. We are really um, pleased to have some presenters from NINDS who are going to take us through that. A good place to think about where you can find the ways to um, find some good outcome measures and a good way of, of annotating them and collecting them so it can be standardized and interoperable with other NINDS and other NIH funded studies um, will be um, great. Dr. Richard Benson will also be using some of that time to, to talk about uh, disparities, which is, of course, um, an extremely important part of what we do and how we can try to make the world more equitable as, as times are, are very tough right now. So um, with that, I think we will uh, adjourn. Um, thank you all for your attention. And we will we will talk in a couple of weeks.